going up. I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Michelle Arkuski. I'm the executive director for She Is The Music. Um, welcome to She Is The Music and our last virtual educational panel for the year, which is crazy to think about. For those of you that are new, She Is The Music is a nonprofit working to increase the number of women working in music, songwriters, engineers, artists, and industry professionals. But today we have an incredible group of women discussing a topic that is so vast with so many moving parts that we could do several panels on this topic alone. But hopefully after this conversation, you'll have a little bit more insight about everyone's jobs and gives you a better understanding of the day-to-day -day for each of these roles and how they work together. So to kick it off, we have two moderators today. Allison Schneider and Anita Chinkis Gratner. Um, Anita, as Executive Vice President of Creative Music Strategy, leads music supervision, which you'll learn about, and original music across Viacom, CBS, cable brands, including BET, CMT, Comedy Central, MTV, Paramount, Showtime, and VH1. So without further ado, I will let Anita and Allison kick off this amazing conversation. Yeah, so I am thrilled to be co-moderating this with Allison Schneider, um, who runs music for NBC Universal. Um, we've got an incredible group of panelists that are going to share their stories with you. Um, you know, the people that we've got here are at the top of their fields and have really accomplished so much. I'm so thrilled to listen to all of their stories myself. Um, so to start off, we have Gina Zamitti and Whitney Martin who are music contractors, and they will tell you all about what that means and their path. We have Leslie Fram, who is the SVP of Music and Talent at CMT. We've got Aureli Chiarti, who is the SVP of Music for Paramount Pictures. Jenny Barrick, who is a profound music editor that has done so much. And we have Mamie Coleman, who is the EVP for Fox Entertainment Music. And Allison, I think I'm going to hand it off to you. All right. Well, um, it's very nice to meet you all. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We're, we're glad that everybody's tuned in, tuned in and um, we're just honored to have um, all of these fantastic women present with us today. We were saying earlier we could talk for hours and hours and hours, but uh, we do have to move this along. So um, basically, Gina and Whitney, I mean, you are music contractors. Um, could you please tell us what that is? What does that mean? And uh, what does it take to become a music contractor? And also, what is a day in your life like? Want me to start? Yep. Um, so what does it take to become a music contractor? I think it's such a niche role in what we do most of the time when we run into people or when I run into people, they don't even know that this job exists or what it entails. Um, so an overview is uh, we are freelancers. We work with composers. Composers will hire us to do um, Basically from A to Z, we hire an orchestra based on the needs that the composer has, what type of project it is, film, TV, live performance. Um, we hire an entire group of professional, mainly orchestral musicians. We book studios, we, um, we run the session once they get there, we pay them. We do soundtracks, so we cover a huge, huge range of um, responsibility with that. So basically a day in the life would be, you know, a composer will call and say, I have a project, it's gonna go next month, I need four or five days at Fox or Sony or Warner Brothers. Um, here's what I'm thinking, this is the type of movie it is. This is the size group I think I need. Um, and then Whitney and I take it from there and we find a studio. We call the players based on the needs of the composer. And um, we record this the score that you hear, whether it be for TV or film or live performance, um, all the music that you hear, we, we work in that part. 
yeah, we basically help um, just all the kind of admin work and the work to get those recording sessions together. Um, you guys hear scores all the time in some of your favorite movies and shows, but those have to get recorded. And so we are kind of the glue to help that all happen. So we work with people like Allison and Aureli sometimes um, to book those recording sessions and basically get all the people that are in, get, get all those people in the same room that need to be there to make that music. Um, exactly. It's a very niche thing, but we love it because we get to be around live music all the time and we get to be with professional musicians who are just incredible. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the basics. How do you get into something like this? I mean, because it is such a niche position and how many of you are there that are doing it? That's what I'm curious. Well, there there's so probably many. about, what is there in LA? There's maybe like six or so people that do it just music contracting, you know, and in that group of people, a couple of them are actual musicians that do it on the side, um, along with their professional work recording. Uh, it's interesting. I got into it because of, you know, I've been in this for 30 years since the early nineties. And I got into it because of a family member who used to do this before, uh, you know, my time. And, and then Whitney and I knew each other and she just really had this love for film score music and was just interested in getting involved in this. And so it was kind of like, there was no real road to get there. You know, it's sort of like word of mouth, I think, because like I said, not that many people know this job exists. And when you really explain it to people or people come to visit, it's interesting because you're on a scoring stage. It's this huge open sound stage that looks like dusty and kind of dark and, you know, but you make beautiful music there. And it seems a little archaic sometimes, but when you get actually get through all the paperwork and admin stuff that Whitney mentioned, you get there and it's like, you have a, you're like listening to the LA Phil or something play a beautiful concert for you. So it's really amazing. It's really, really cool. And um, it would be awesome if more people knew about this type of work that goes on. Yeah. And it's, it's always evolving too. You know, I'm, I think the basic thing we do is hire orchestras, right. But like Gina and all you guys know, we do a bunch of other things too. So it's hard to mm -hmm. explain in just the short time that we have today, but yeah. In terms of um, getting into it, I would just say from my perspective, it's been about 10 years working with Gina, which has been awesome. And I feel so lucky for all the things, um, all the people that we've gotten to work with and all the music that we've gotten to hear. And like she said, I was just interested in film music forever since I was a kid. So if you have an interest like that, just as you move throughout the world, you never know who you're going to meet, no matter what city you're in. I see a lot of people are from tons of different cities, which is amazing, mm -hmm. but there are music communities everywhere that you are. So focus on talking with people, let what you're interested in be known, ask questions and, you know, always ask if somebody needs help. If, if you see somebody doing what you want to do, ask them if they need help and write down their names and remember who they are and you never know when your paths may cross again. So I know that people Very here probably are interested in, you know, some people are interested in film music, some people are interested in music supervision or all kinds of things, but that would apply, I think across the board, just um, bookmark people's websites that you're interested in and. Yep, really good advice. Um, it's true. And I think uh, if I were to give sort of a, a main overview, which may or may not make sense to some of you who don't know how it works with like union or non-union kind of stuff that goes on, um, we're liaisons between the union, which is the AFM, the film company, which could be Universal, Paramount, Fox, uh, Warner Brothers and the creatives in the music department there. 
um, the composer and the musicians. So our hats change a little bit once we get to the actual recording date, you know, where we have booked and done all of this stuff to get everybody to the stage. Now that we're there, we're making sure everybody's getting their breaks and we're not causing lots of overtime, which is going to cost a lot of money. And so we're just sort of kind of the people that have to make everybody happy. We want to make sure, you know, the film company is not spending more than we told them it's going to cost. And the composer is happy with the musicians we've hired and the musicians are happy with the breaks that they're getting. And, you know, and so it's a little bit of all of that. So you really, it's really relational. And I would say with this whole panel of women who are all amazing, the best thing you can do is I'm kind of like what Whitney said is just nurture and go after those relationships and just be authentic. And you never know who you're going to meet one day that ends up being, you know, VP of music at Paramount. Like I've known Arelli forever when she very first started. And so it's just great how you see people moving from this job to that job and just making their way up because they're, you know, professional and creative and hard workers. Do you have to, and this is the last question because I know we ran out of time. Do you have to play an instrument to be a contractor and read music or is a lot of it relational? I would say a lot of it's relational. I'll just talk quickly and then let Whitney finish this up. Um, I played an instrument when I was young for a handful of years. I always knew I was going to work in music. I have a really good ear. Um, but a lot of this is relational. And um, Whitney, on the other hand, is a fantastic pianist. And she can yeah, read I music. I do play and, and she- I love it, but I never <laughs> thought it would be, you know, I never thought I could actually make a living in anything music. I thought I was going to be a nurse and so kind of fell into this and and speaking that musical language definitely does help um, in any of our jobs, I think. You know, there's mm-hmm. you may not have to know, you, you may not be have to be able to read music, but um speaking that language definitely helps a lot. So yes, if you do play an instrument, keep playing. Well, thank you. I, I know at the end we're gonna we're gonna actually save some time at the very end of this for questions. So any of you that have been tuning in as you go, please make note and maybe please keep kind of top lining them in the chat for us so that we can make sure that we can address your questions at the end. And then Anita, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great. Yes. Um, next up, uh, Leslie. Um, it would be great to hear uh, you tell tell the the panel about um, your role at CMT and um, all the things that you do every day. Thank you, Anita. And by the way, Anita's a rock star. We're part of the same company, and she's incredible. Um, what I did, I've been at CMT for ten years, and I oversee music and talent at CMT. We, there isn't a day that we're not in the business of music. So 365 days a year, we are promoting country music, whether it's our incredible digital so- social team run by Melissa Goldberg. Um, we, I don't think there was a time, even during COVID, that we were not in production and it was really challenging. And I have to hand it to our production team with Heather Graffinino and, and Margaret Como that they led the team in everything that we did. Um, CMT is known for music. We have two award shows a year, and I help oversee the booking and talent side of that. We also have um, a living, breathing countdown show, which is three hours every weekend that promotes country music and has news, and they travel all over the world to promote country music. And we have three video channels. Um, Videos are still a way for music discovery, so we have two 24-hour video channels, and we also play videos in the morning at CMT. We also have music franchises that promote artists on every level of their career. So it's not always about the Carrie Underwoods and the Blake Sheltons. We have franchises that support unsigned artists. I'm really proud of a franchise we started in 2013 called Next Women of Country because I don't know if you've read, but it's very challenging for women to be recognized, especially in in terrestrial radio. Um, largely their voices are not heard. So we started this franchise to support 
their content and their videos. And shortly after that, we started a tour so that they would have a stage to play on because it's very hard to get on a tour if you don't have a song on the radio. Um, and then we started a franchise called Equal Play two years ago that all of our video channels are programmed 50-50 male-female with also an eye to diversity and inclusion. So we're very proud about that. We have some other things that we're gonna do next year to take equal play to the next level. But overall, we have a lot of women that oversee a lot of initiatives and departments at CMT. So I'm really proud about that from press to digital to you know our BALA team. There are women in, at the head in every department which is really exciting. And I have a team of six people, all women except one guy named Stacy. But um, again, I'm excited. Uh, the other thing I'm really excited about is that this will be our first year having the CMT Music Awards on CBS, which will be April 3rd. So we're already working on that in uh, January, February. We'll be very busy working on the award show. All amazing. Um, so Leslie, you got your start in radio and yes. um, I would love to hear a little bit if you could tell us how you transitioned from radio into television um, if you could talk about that path absolutely um, the first part of my career the first 20 years of my career was in radio where I had a dual role I was on air and also program director in rock mainly rock and alternative I did a few years in top 40 um, my last job was in New York working with Matt Pinfield, who many of you may know, doing a morning show and also programming the radio station. And when they sold that station, I sort of, one of my mentors was Brian Phillips, um, who I'd known throughout my career. He was the president of CMT. And I was looking around and thinking, you know, I'm going to go to another radio station. And Brian said, wait a second, why don't you like open the aperture, look about all the things that you've learned about marketing to a music audience and think outside of radio, which I had never done before because radio was my first love. So I, you know, I really sat back and started talking and doing interviews with people, you know, everything from music television to a lot of the DSPs. And it really led me to working with Brian in Nashville. So I kind of did a 180. And again, I took a leap of faith because not only did I go from radio to television, but I went from rock to a genre that I didn't know a lot about, which was country music. Um, and Brian brought me in and was like, you'll figure out the job. You already know how to market to a music audience. So I think the first year I really just put my head down. And of course, everyone in the building, it was open arms to really help me understand the job. And then really to understand the format and meet a whole new set of people. So I ended up trying to have three or four meetings a day. And then also I went to a lot of shows just to look at the audience and look at the research and listen to a lot of music to kind of absorb the history of this genre. And what's great about CMT is we have, we have a franchise called Crossroads, which is artists from other genres. So I've been able to utilize, you know, my contacts over the years with rock and alternative and, and pop to help put those shows together. But that's how I came over to CMT. But it was definitely a learn. It was definitely a learning curve for me transitioning from radio to television. So interesting. I I, I forget that you didn't start in country. I can't imagine <laughs> you doing anything but country. It's just so. It's such a part of um, how we all know you now. Um, so so for um, the women who are attending this, I think it would be interesting to know how did you get your start in radio and any advice to people who are starting out or might be interested in following a path like yours? Well, when I was in high school, I was, um, I thought I was going to be a journalist. I was really, you know, I loved music. I was very shy, but you know, part of being shy was listening to the radio and listening to music and buying and consuming music. And there was a small radio station in my town, in my hometown. And in high school, I interned there and I just developed the bug for radio. I love the mechanics of it. I love being behind the scenes. I love the programming aspect of it. And obviously I loved the music. So I did that in high school and then all through college, I was working, you know, midnight to six and crazy hours at certain radio stations and decided I really wanted to become a program director. And so I was in radio for many years in Atlanta at uh, a station called 99X, which was, you know, in the heyday of alternative music in the 90s. 
and then worked in New York for several years before coming here. But um, I still love radio. I know radio with consolidation has changed tremendously, but I still have a lot of friends that are in radio that absolutely love it. And there's so many other things you can do in radio outside of being on the air. There's music director, program director, promotions director. You know, there's so many aspects of radio that um, that I love and I think people would love as a career. Are you seeing a lot of women in those types of roles in radio? It was really tough because I would go to a lot of conventions and a lot of women were relegated to, you know, being the person that laughed on a morning show. And it was very difficult because it was sort of a boys club and you have to, as a female, work hard, be willing to move around, um, be willing to take a leap of faith because largely there are still, you know, in those management positions of program directors and SVPs are still, it's very male dominated, but I was really was lucky to work for champions like Brian Phillips, who made me a program director in Atlanta. And then when I went to New York, I was hired by a general manager who knew of my work in Atlanta. So I think it was a lot of just really, you know, probably what Gina said a minute ago about being professional and doing the work. Mm -hmm. That's, that's great. I think um, I, I could talk to you all day. I'm so interested personally in your, in, in everything um, that you're saying, but I think we have to move on to the next person. Um, so Allison, I'm going to kick it back to you. We, uh, thank you, Leslie. I agree. I could, I mean, like you're seeing earlier, I could sit with all of you ladies um, for days, probably. Uh, we want to move this over to the feature film side of things with Aureli from Paramount Pictures. If you could tell us a little bit about your life. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Aureli. I'm the Senior Vice President of Music at Paramount Pictures. And um, what we do is we basically oversee all of the music strategy for our films. Um, so we cover the big Paramount Division, Paramount Animation, Nickelodeon, Paramount Players, which is our boutique label. Um, and what does that mean? Basically, you know, it, it's it's getting together with the filmmakers. It starts off with, you know, understanding what the project is. And I'm, I'll use an example. I'm actually working with Gina and Whitney on The Lost City, um, which is our upcoming Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum movie. And, you know, it basically starts off with us taking a look at the script. We, we read it. We kind of have, you know, kind of create our own idea of what the music's going to be, you know, whether it's going to be primarily underscore, um, who that composer might, might be. We start to drum up some ideas of people that we might want to pitch to the filmmakers. Um, and it's also inclusive of budgeting, right? Like music, it, it costs money, it's expensive, you know, so we have to put together um, an analysis for the studio as to what we think the music's going to cost. Um, and then secondarily, you know, we get together with the filmmakers, we kind of exchange ideas as to what we think it's, it's going to be. Um, sometimes directors are very open and interested in learning about new ideas, new composers. We are very lucky with um, Adam and Aaron, the, our directors on the project, because they were extremely open to our ideas as it, when it, pertain, as it pertained to composers. And we were able to um, introduce them to the music of Pinar Toprak, who is a wonderful female composer. Um, and they absolutely loved her music. And she, she read the script. She provided a demo um, for us to listen to, and she absolutely nailed it um so she's you know come on board we she i'm actually seeing her tomorrow we're gonna go to her studio and listen to the first score ideas and thematic ideas that she's put together um and from there you know we'll start to produce the score alongside her the producers which are sandra bullock and liza chasson um and you know and the studio so it's a, a management of understanding what works best for the movie. Is it, um, is it an emotional moment or is it a big action adventure moment? And making sure that we are producing the best film possible, you know? And as it pertains to the song side, you know, we also work um, with managers, labels, publishers to understand what music might be the best for the film. We um, recently worked on Spongebob, the movie, last year, and were able to produce an amazing soundtrack. Uh, we partnered with Neon 16, which is Tiny's label, and from there we're able to produce about 10 original songs for the movie, um, one of which was Agua by J Balvin, um, which went on to just become a big viral 
TikTok sensation and has now been uh, awarded platinum, I believe. So I'm really excited about that. But, um, you know, day to day, it just it, it varies. It depends on what fire is the hottest and which one we're going to put out first. Um, but overall, it's just, you know, being embedded on the day to day of our projects and and making sure that we're telling the story the best way possible through music. How did you get your start? So I had a very serendipitous um, start, I think, with my with my music uh, supervision career. I actually um, grew up in Boyle Heights and you know, obviously very close to Hollywood, but not knowing really what Hollywood was. Um, I, you know, went to school and really was always drawn to journalism as well as Leslie. Um, I loved Barbara Walters and she was an inspiration for me growing up. So I um, enrolled at Cal State LA and they had a communications program. So um, that's where I really kind of started to understand a little bit more about entertainment and what the industry was. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I was able to get um, a job at Univision. Uh, I started off as an intern there and then started to work my way into, um, you know, the, the news production team, but very quickly realized that, you know, it was a little disillusioned, I think, by, by journalism at that point. Um, just the, the stories we were telling weren't compelling or not fulfilling to me, you know, so I was a little lost, to be honest, um, and a friend of mine was hosting a job fair um, for her company, ABC7, and I remember not wanting to go. It was so reluctant to go. And I actually only had one resume, one piece of paper with me. Um, but I went and I immediately gravitated towards the Fox booth because um, I grew up watching the Sim Simpsons, Rest of De Development. So I was like, oh, let's see what they're about, you know? And um, yeah, I hit it off with the HR representative. She brought me in for an interview the next day. And the next thing I know, I'm working as the assistant to the head of music publishing at Fox. Um, um, which was my first introduction to music. And I honestly didn't know that my job existed. It's something that I completely fell into. Um, and learning the fundamentals of music publishing was really, really helpful in understanding what goes into producing music, what goes into all of the licensing, the rights, the money, um, all of that. But I knew that I wanted to be in a creative field. Um, so from there, I was able to move my way up into the creative department. And that's really where I I learned, you know, the process of music supervision. I had a lot of great men mentors along the way, Amy Driscoll, um, you know, Patrick Houlihan, a lot of the people, the best in the business. So I was very lucky to have been formally trained, as they say, you know, under, under my mentors. But um, I had a very, yeah, it was a very serendipitous um, arrival. And I'm very, I'm very fortunate that, that it's working out. <laughs> What do you think? I think one of the reasons that we really wanted to have um, you and Mamie representing the film and TV side of things, um, being that you're both music supervisors, which is something that everybody's so in love with. I mean, so many people want to be music supervisors, but the the qualities that it takes to actually be within a studio system. And I guess how best would you describe that? Um, what are the key skills? Um, What's the personality type? Just kind of anything you can do to help them see the difference between being outside versus being inside. And maybe think yeah. about what your answer is going to be when we get to you later too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it, you know, obviously for us, it's project dependent. We do a lot of in-house music supervision, but there are projects um, that we need outside help, right? So we'll hire independent music supervisors to come help us create the, the music. Um, you know, so I think in, in order to, not in order, but for me, one of the things that have, has really helped throughout my career is just being nimble, right? Being able to to switch um, ideas, to move very quickly, to work, you know, in tandem, both with my filmmakers, but also with my studio executives, right? I think we are primarily the liaison between the studio and the production and the filmmakers, um, which is often tough, right? There's a lot of politics that go into to making films and there's, there are challenges with inherently within that, you know? So I think it's important to have somebody that can really understand and decipher the ideas, right? Because I think sometimes we're all saying the same thing, we're just saying them differently. So the ability to showcase what everybody I think interpret and showcase what I think is the right um, idea is has been very helpful for me, you know, and really, um, 
just understanding how to diffuse the energy in a room is something that I've, I've learned actually through George Draculius, who's one of the, the best in the business. And it's just about levity too, you know, coming in and, and having a positive attitude. Um, but also, you know, making sure that you are not just coming in with one idea, because that's, that's always, that, that's the best thing about music supervision is that it could be a multitude of things, right? And we, with music, it's very subjective. Um, so I think the process of experimentation is also something that's really, is really what helps kind of convey, you know, the best, the best use of songs or the best use of score in the particular moment. Um, but in addition to that, I think, you know, just being able to communicate is important. I think sometimes a lot gets lost in textilation, you know, through through emails or <laughs> or text messages or anything. So I think having um, and it's something I've struggled with, right? The idea of how do you how do you send an email to somebody that you're nervous about, or you know, that's a producer, that's a high level director, whatever it may be, and just having the ability to really be concise about what you're trying to achieve. So I think communication is is an important part um, of being in the studio system, you know, and also just learning how to how to be a partner along the way with your creative executives on the studio side and also your directors and producers as well. Thank you so much. All sure. right, Anita, you want to take it from here? Thanks, Allison. Jenny, um, Jenny Barrick, I think we are um, tossing it over to you to talk about music editing. I know there's a lot of interest from the chat in your specific role, so I'll hand it over to you. You could talk about a day in the life. Okay, so hi. Um, a day in my life uh, as a music editor can consist of many things where's the fire going to be put out is exactly what I deal with. But so today um, I'm putting together an episode of Grey's Anatomy, um, which includes cutting all the songs that the music supervisors give me to put in. I'm not picking the songs myself, but they've already been agreed to before it gets to me. So I'll edit them in the way we discuss. Um, but a typical day can start with people sending me scenes. We need temp music for this. We tried this, we've tried that, nothing's working. And so I'll throw like three or four ideas at them. Um, and sometimes it's for an established show, like for instance, Grey's Anatomy, which we have 18 years worth of score that's established that I can choose from, which is great. But there's other instances where, you know, it's a new show that it's a pilot and they don't have anything established so sometimes i'm helping to establish what the sound is going to be for that series um which is a lot of fun and it's a lot of a challenge um and you just kind of throw things at the wall and see what sticks and um sometimes you get composers a job that way um and it's just very interesting and sometimes it takes five six seven eight times before you get lucky and people connect with what you've sent them um and sometimes it's a lot easier so um so that's the temping aspect of my job but there are other times uh that i'm working with composers and producers, what we call spotting sessions, where we go through the whole episode of a show and we decide where is the music gonna be. And when we decide where the music is gonna start and end, we also discuss, well, what's the emotion that we wanna convey? Is this something where we wanna break your heart? Is this something that they're just walking down the hallway and it's a walk and talk? And so we talk about the vibes and the colors and the themes of what it's going to sound like and sometimes it's going to be a montage and it's a song and then okay well then we have our music supervisor that comes in and is like okay well i'll pitch x y and z songs and then we'll try them out until the producer picks something that they like um so that's that's like the spotting session i'll put together notes for the composer they'll go off and write whatever they're gonna write. Uh, I'll go back and start editing any of the music that I've already temped 
I'll re I'll repurpose it, pull in the stems from other episodes and get that together. Um, and then I'll present that to the dub stage. And uh, from there, it's like a big collaboration of all the music comes together with the dialogue, the sound effects, and all the sounds are just coming into one place. And from there, we collaborate on what do we like here? Like, should the music be louder? Should it be softer? Gosh, maybe we don't even need that cue there at all. Sometimes silence is good. Uh, sometimes you've already played so much music that it's it's time for just a moment of silence. Let's feel that discomfort. Um, so it's always a moving target. There's nothing is solid. You, if you hear a producer say that they like something one day and the next day they don't like it anymore, you're just going to make them happy and say, OK, well, what vibe do you want to feel now? And then sometimes on the mix stage it's it's just a matter of okay well you know we have what the composer wrote for you but we're going to try something else and um it's just always ever moving and you have to be able to just go with the flow at all times um and so it's a lot of fun if you are if you're able to like live on fire so to speak uh then it's really exciting job um if you don't do well with you know just having things thrown at you then it's probably not uh good it's not ever um predictable there's nothing predictable about being a music editor um so that's kind of like my daily there's also administrative things cue sheets have to be done at the end of the episode, which is when we kind of say, well, this is what we ended up with. And we'll give a list with the song titles, the cue titles, and who wrote the cue, and who's getting the publishing for it. So um, that's basically a day in the life. Jenny, going back to the spotting session again, mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more, go a little deeper um, on who's in the spotting session and what the communication is like and the flow? Absolutely. So in the spotting session, it's um, the composer, myself, the music supervisor, uh, the editor of the show and the producers. And we just watch it down. And basically, we just discuss like the composer might say, I think we need a cue here. And, the, and then, you know, if we'll just try something, just throw something in and kind of talk about what it could be or what it doesn't need to be. And we all just talk about, you know, should it have pace? Should it have pace and be heartbreaking? And there's a lot of like things that music is supposed to do that to convey, okay, we kind of want to move this fast, but it really is heartbreaking. So how do you do that with music? And so the composer is kind of figuring out while we're talking about it, well, you know, how would I do that? And they're given a lot of jobs of, you know, how do I convey what I what I'm feeling with this character, but also down the road, it's going to be bigger. These two people are going to be together again soon. And so you kind of have to pace yourself with, you know, where when that theme starts and kind of develops. And so we all talk about that during the spotting session as well. Um, you know, just how to build to the final moment. Are there ever situations where people just don't see eye to eye? And if that happens, how do you resolve it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, TV is a producer's medium. So ultimately they win. Um, and if people don't see eye to eye, I mean, there's, I've never seen anything that's, you know, comes to a fight, <laughs> you know, usually, you know, someone will state their case, someone else will state their case. And, you know, it's it's really a collaborative environment and people like to be listened to. Um, but at the end of the day, whatever the producer, the showrunner decides they want, that's exactly what they're going to get. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so how did you get your start? How did you become a music editor? Um, so that is... Um, 
an interesting question because I never knew what a music editor was. Uh, as as many I'm understanding the panel, many people are saying the same thing. I never knew that that existed, and so I had just graduated um, college, cinema and television arts, and I was a PA for a while, just in production, running around getting people's coffee, and I just kind of went around to all the different departments during my day and I would figure out, well, what do I like? Who, you know, who's interesting to me and where am I drawn to? Um, and so I met with the editor uh, and when one day I was talk chatting with him and a few other people and I was telling them, you know, I'm looking for something permanent, I'm looking for a job. And um, they said, oh, well, we just met a music editor who's hiring, you should call them. And well, what is that? What do they do? I don't know, but you should call them. <laughs> so ultimately I did. And I started working for uh, him and he had another girl working there as well. Um, and I just loved it. I couldn't believe like it was everything I ever wanted. I always loved music growing up. And now like I have the ability to apply music to um, film and see the results it's it's just so cool but so that's how i fell into it it was just right place right time and um and i also had the qualifications to be able to follow through it's so so cool um and so many people so many of us have been right place right time situation you know i think it's what you do next after you've get get that opportunity that really um matters as so many people have said today um, okay, so being mindful of time, um, Allison, maybe I think uh, you are the last um, last speaker. Yeah, and I think Mamie, um, who is television at Fox, I was looking at the questions also, so I think you could actually address a couple of the questions as well, because um, one of the amazing things about Mamie is that she also had oversight of marketing at Fox. And somebody had asked um, if anybody here had touched the show New Girl, so perhaps through marketing. And also when you're telling us about your, your job, could you also explain the differences between promos, marketing versus what you're doing with shows and just yeah. what, what the music differences are and things like that? Yeah, sure. So hi, everybody. I'm Amy Cohen. I know I have like 10 minutes to talk. Um, you know, save the best for last, but uh, I lead the Fox Entertainment Music Division and we're called FEM. We uh, have all females except for one, like you. Uh, um, somebody on here said they had one male. We have one male. Um, and I'm responsible for all the music creative for Fox Entertainment and our streamer, Tubi, and our animation studio, Bento Box. Um, this includes the creation of all original music for our promotional and in-show use across the our properties and platforms. Um, and, you know, FIM, Fox Entertainment has produced a broad spanning music catalog of like 200 original songs intended for sync licensing. And um, we've created 15 to 20, I think like 20, we're up to 20 now, theme songs for Fox own uh, productions. And we recently uh, finished up with uh, three new branding mnemonics for Fox Entertainment, Fox Alternative and Bento Box. Uh, currently working on TV. So it's an exciting time for us right now um, for FEM. Um, and we're going to continue to play an integral, you know, role in driving equality and inclusion throughout the Fox uh, entertainment by recruiting, you know, uh, a range of diverse voices within a creative community. Um, and with respect to your question, as far as the differences between promo marketing, that is where I started um, 28 years ago. I have not left my job. I've been here 30 years. Um, well, this year, next year will be 30 years. I'm, I'm in my 29th year um, and I'm only 29. Uh, so I've started, you know, in, as an intern and slowly moved my way up in the company. Uh, and, you know, I learned through marketing and promos and, you know, producing songs, original songs for promos and pitching songs uh, for promos um, for the primetime show. So what happens is you, you get a show and there's a promo producer is asking for a particular song or a genre or a scene that, you know, they're, they're kind of like interested in finding a piece of music in order to launch that particular uh, series or an episodic episode, um, I mean, episodic um, promo. So we're tasked to find music 
for this particular launch or promo. And with regard to programming, um, like Allison and Anita, we, um, you know, we oversee the programming side of it. And we are finding music and hiring musicians, uh, hiring music supervisors, producers, composers, uh, everybody and mother uh, for our shows um, to be able to use the music and for promos. Um, right now we're working on um, the Mass, the sixth season of Mass Singer. We're working on a new show. Uh, well, Alter uh, Ego was also something that we're working on um, that just finished up. And then uh, we're preparing to launch our new family drama, which I will be asking you, Leslie, for some advice because I too have not fallen into this whole country genre. And it's it's been a fun it's been a fun ride and a challenging ride at the same time. Uh, but uh, we're preparing to launch our new family drama, which is called Monarch. And it's starring Susan Sarandon, Anna Frio, and Trace Atkins, and Beth Ditto. Uh, and it's set in Austin. Um, and it's a multi-generational musical drama about America's first family in country music. So it's it's been an exciting time for us to work on this project. And I'm excited because it's a wholly owned Fox owned show. And you know, just to be a part of that has been kind of just amazing. So Mamie, since you've been there since you were five, um, how did you first get there? Was it kindergarten and then- Yeah, five? kindergarten. Or so I interesting, interesting enough, I snuck off, and don't do this kids, but I snuck off um, on a spring break and went to uh, Jack the Rapper in Atlanta. Um, it's a big showcase for um, hip hop and R&B uh, artists. And I, I met a, couple, a guy there who worked for Yo! and TV Raps, Anita at MTV. Um, and I then went to New York on this, you know, uh, spring thing and uh, spring break thing and sat in the audience. And, you know, I always tell people this. They always ask me, how did you get there? It's really networking and speaking up in, in, in these meetings or at a, wherever you are. You just never know. So I'm sitting next to the pre my predecessor at Fox and I'm telling her, yeah, I, work, I go to Cal State Northridge. And like Leslie and um, Ariel, I was in journalism. That's what I was um, majoring in. And then I kind of shifted and did radio, television, film, because I was like, I'm not really into journalism because I don't want to be reporting about the bad, negative, you know, stories. It's kind of like, Ugh. so I started doing radio, television, film. In addition to, um, I was a choreographer, dancer. So my ear is a little different than most people. Um, I hear things differently. I played three instruments. Um, don't play them now. Couldn't tell you, couldn't read music, couldn't tell you any of that. So uh, like Whitney say, you know, continue playing piano, whatever instrument, because it does help you in the long run when you're giving notes to uh, producers and composer. It really does help. I'm not going to lie about that. But I was sitting in an uh, audience at Young Senior Brands, met my predecessor, and she got me a gig as an intern. And I stayed at five been at Fox for, like I said, 30 years. I moved my slowly, move my slowly, move my way up in the company because, as you know, as women, it is difficult and being a minority woman at that, it's difficult. So if there are women out there, young girls that are looking into getting into this side of the business, um, you know, being a TV executive, music executive, all, all these wonderful women um, on here can tell you it is, it's tough and you have to grow tough skin um, but and not take anything personal, but be communicative and be humble. And also, you know, when you make it to the top or you make it to the next level, you should be able to send down the elevator to the, to the girls downstairs and get them back up where you are. Uh, Cause that's what's, that's what's gonna matter. Um, I, like I said, I have a team of all women with the exception of Matt Bailey. Um, and, you know, I'm always about, you know promoting and making sure empowering people, making sure people are speaking up in meetings and they don't feel left out. I'm, we're very inclusive of, you know, um, of, of just my team. So. Yeah, that's pretty much where I started as an intern and moved slowly moved my way up in the company. So uh, it's just also inspirational. I'm, I'm fangirling on everybody, even though we're all kind of doing some of the same things, but yeah. I think everybody has their own special touch. Um, and I think you kind of, I was going to say, if you wanted to, to tell how you kind of vary from Aureli's role, but I think you kind of hit it. I mean, it, it's all basically firefighting and it's all. Yes. Yes. Being patient and knowing how to manage strong personalities and yeah. all of that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just happy that I'm still at Fox and I love Fox. Um, you know, we're a very nimble new startup company, Fox Entertainment, obviously, you know, out of the Disney uh, deal, the transaction, that whole thing happened where we started as a new division. So I'm excited about that. Again, like 
I started, I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be, you know, an on-air radio personality. I wanted to be a lot of things. I also wanted to be a fly girl, you know, and I, I made it to the second round and didn't get it because I was too short. I was good at dancing, but it's too short. So this was the next best thing. Uh, yeah, I live in color. That was the next best thing is to be behind the scenes. And this is just an exciting time, like I said. Thank you. Um, so I guess, Anita, we should probably take the last few minutes and get into some questions. Yeah, there are quite a few. Um, sorry, guys, as we have to read, I want, I was so into listening to everybody that I was barely getting any time to read anything. I know one of the things that I saw, um, and gosh, I say, um, probably, you know, Aurelia, I'll send this back to you is, um, how do you find your music? That is one of the things that people are wondering. And where is it being curated from? Is there, do you only go with people that you know? Do you try to use things within blankets? Yes. Oh. And adding on to that, um, for the music contractors, I saw a question about where do you find your musicians? Mm. Where do you source? Okay. So we can go to that one next after a rally. Yeah, I mean, I think for for me personally, I um, you know obviously I have great relationships over the lot that I've built over the last sixteen years. So a lot of it is through just trusted sources that I have. It also just depends on the project and what I'm looking specifically for. Um, I have a great team. I have Lena for my team, who's a, an amazing creative person who also keeps me very young and knows all of the things that are, are relevant in the music. So I think together we, you know, we do take music, um, but we also have briefs that we send out that are a little bit more specific. So a brief basically outlines a little bit of a scene description, maybe a, tr a reference track that we're trying to replace or we're trying to beat. Um, and we send that out to our, our trusted friends in the, in the, in the industry to help, you know, kind of find that, that gold nugget, um, you know, but it's all through relationships, experimentation as well. Um, I'm also big on TikTok, you know, so I find a lot of my uh, music there. I, you know, I, I work with Jake on Clifford, uh, who I discovered um, on TikTok. We have a song with Madison Beer as well on Clifford, the Big Red Dog. Um, so I'm very open to just kind of seeing also what what is sparking conversations and, and cultural um, platforms as well. But I think for the most part, um, you know, we do have trusted sources, but we do often take I some of the best music I've heard is oftentimes from somebody that found my email and randomly randomly sent me something and I absolutely loved it and have become friends with that person and we're just actively trying to play some of their music so um but yeah primarily working through you know labels publishers sync agencies um and more importantly just tailoring it specifically to what we need for the project you know Um, what I know it's probably individual for all of you. What is, and then sorry, we'll go over to Whitney and Gina. What is the best way for people to reach out to you? Are you open? Are you genuinely open to people finding your email address? Same to Mamie, um, yeah. Leslie, or is there a better means? Yeah, I, I like when people hit me on uh, LinkedIn because sending emails to my direct uh, Fox email box is, is chaotic. It's just, we already get enough emails. We barely can go through half of the publishers and the labels that send us you know, enormous amount of music. So I'd, I'd say LinkedIn and any social media, you can DM me, um, you, you just never know. I'm good with um, email or LinkedIn, not Facebook Messenger. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Same LinkedIn, um, Instagram is really easy as well. Direct messages on there are really helpful. And um, I think, you know, if you're trying to pitch music, I think it's important to make it really accessible, right? Like you, you know, kind of don't make someone go through three steps to try to get to the song. If you can have it readily there, if there's any kind of comp visual component attached to it, whatever it may be, just make sure that it's, you know, it, it plays automatically and it doesn't make you log on to something else. I think the more accessible, the better. All right. Um, Gina and Whitney, how do you source you, your musicians? Um, that's a good question. It's kind of like what Arelli said, where we do have our trusted sources. Um, we definitely have a lot of people that reach out um, once they've graduated from, from colleges or um, music schools. And a lot of times, because of where our like physical position is on a scoring stage, 
if somebody, you know, a flute player wants to have the opportunity to get hired, we will oftentimes ask a couple of our section leaders to sit down with these people and give them a quote unquote sort of like, I wouldn't call it an audition, but just like, here's some music, here's a few different pieces. How is your reading? Um, you know, how is your personality in dealing with things? Because a lot of times you could be a really amazing musician and eventually you'll make a really great uh, recording musician, but you just need a little bit of different experience. You need to be, maybe start on things that are a little slower paced because it's definitely a, the red light comes on and you are playing the music as if you've been playing it for 10 years. So mm -hmm. it's really about the, your reading skills, but we always encourage people, if this is what you wanna do, and maybe you're not ready, we're happy to even hook you up with some of the people in the orchestra that teach so that you can learn from the best, really, because that's really what it comes down to. Um, <clears throat> there's another great question about um, editing. Um, you know, in this age of COVID, is editing something that can be done virtually or do you need to be in the major cities um, that are producing content? Do you see any changes happening there? And I think that's kind of the same for all of these roles. Ha have more opportunities opened up because you may not have to be in the major cities. That's interesting. Um, I mean, I could get up and leave LA right now <laughs> if I had to. Um, because yeah, everything with COVID has been done online. I have not had to step on a mixed stage in two years. Um, but yeah, if I don't know that that's the way to break in though. It, it's it, yeah. it, to be new now without having established relationships that then those people trust you to move out and go remote. Um, I, I can see that that would be difficult. So. Uh, it's got to be hard right now during COVID so that everyone's a, apart from each other and can't make connections. Uh, I would say reach out, make phone calls, try to get Zoom calls so you can get to know people because uh, that's the way to do it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I also think that being a part of mentorship programs like this, she is a music um, you're networking and you're going to be able to reach out to us, a couple of us, all of us, if that matter. Um, uh, and, you know, for me, for songwriting, producing songs, um, we have songwriting camps. We, do, we hold these quarterly songwriting camps and we have been so productive virtually. Uh, it, it's even better. We, have, we produce better music um, on Zoom calls, which is the most bizarre thing ever. Um, but, you know, I think we've, I, again, like I said, we, we're more productive um, virtually in this whole pandemic. So it's been a huge asset for us. Um, but, you know, you do miss the whole human contact. You do miss being in recording studios and on set and stuff like that. It's just the COVID restrictions of it all can be a buzz killer. Um, I think this is kind of, this is an important question. Um, how do y'all deal with self-doubt? Well, you get a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> you reach out to each other. You've got, cool, <laughs> you got a cool ass boss who, you know, or a mentor that believes in you and can, you know, inspire you and make, make sure that you're not feeling that way. You know, you, you're able to have those conversations. Um, I started off with Gail Berman, her and I had a, a great relationship. Then there was Dana Walden and, um, you know, Angela Curtin and now Amy Carney. I mean, I have the best mentors and female mentors in this business. And even at my age and at my level, you still need a mentor. You still need to work on that because all of us on this call can tell you that we do still self-doubt. You, you have self-doubt and you are insecure in these positions to a certain degree. We've been doing this forever, but there's times when you're feeling like, God, I don't know if I did that right. I don't know if I said that right. Or I'm nervous to get on a call with this director to give him notes because he's going to be, he's going to rip my head off. Um, you just, you just got to have a good team and, and people around that, that surround you that are inspiring and that will motivate you not to feel that way. Yeah. And I think, yeah, mentorship is so valuable and I agree and echo everything Mamie said. And, you know, also 
I've struggled myself with imposter syndrome because I don't come from a musical background. I kind of took the left turn, you know, and stumbled upon this, but through hard work um, and also just gaining confidence slowly. And it's something that we, you know, everyone's going to go through. The more you do something, um, the less scary it becomes, right? Because I think doubting yourself is primarily because of the unknown. So the fears that go into that, and I think giving yourself a little credit and just saying, you know what, this is what I've been able to accomplish, you know, even as small as it may be, just harness into any accomplishment that you have and use that as the confidence that you need to walk in, you know, but always have an ally in, in mentorships. I think that for me has been um, just a true, a, a true partnership and commitment. Um, and it's symbiotic, right? It's a mutual relationship and mm-hmm. they learn from us, from us as well. Um, but I think it, it's okay to have those feelings, right? I think sometimes we force ourselves to invalidate some of that, but, um, but it's also okay to be proud of everything that you've done and everything that you've accomplished along the way. Cause it's so, it's so easy to, you know, lean towards a negative, but there's a lot that you guys are doing already that is important yeah. and will hopefully help you build your confidence. Yeah. And if I could add to that, um, I was thinking actually before the question was asked that um, early on in my career, I remember having this revelation where people who were more established or had been in the business longer would just start like talking about things as if I knew everything they were talking about. And for a while I would walk away and I would go like, well, who is that? What movie is that? What are they talking about? Like, I didn't know anything that they were saying, but I acted like I did. And then I decided I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually ask questions and go, what, what do you mean? I don't know what that is. So in turn, it's helped me to sort of not do that to people and not be the, I'm assuming, you know, everything I'm talking about, because most of the time you don't, we're all coming from different places this, you know, everything that we do, all these women on this panel, there's so much content. We couldn't possibly know every person or every avenue that we all walk down. So I think it's okay. Just ask questions, really ask questions. And um, I think like Jenny said, when, when she was a serving coffee, like that's the best place to be where you can actually look around and, and do what she did and say, I definitely don't want like that part of the business, but this part is pretty interesting. So just ask and just be the person that doesn't, you know, don't make it so that, oh gosh, if I ask, they're going to think I know nothing. Just do it. I think also is being okay to get down into the trenches. I can remember when I first got into radio, I would do anything. I mean, I would sleep on the floor of the radio station just to absorb all of the knowledge. And I feel like that is still in me today to be in the trenches and to work as hard as I always have and don't be afraid to do that. But I always have people around me where I can get a gut check of like, Hey, how did I handle that situation? You know, you have to put your ego to the side and know that we're not perfect. It's okay to make mistakes. Love that. I think just passing on validation too. I don't think people kind of give each other a pat on the back enough in this industry. So Whenever somebody does tell me, you know, hey, you did a great job there or wow, I remember when you were this way and you've grown so much or whatever it is, um, I always just say, make sure I say thank you to those people like thanks that really actually helps me and make sure that I'm saying those kind of things to people as well that maybe you saw them 10 years ago in a certain role and now they're doing this make sure you tell people that you're proud of them. And I think when I focus on being really leveling with people on a human level um, in any of these, with any colleague or coworker, it helps me feel more confident, you know? So remember what their wife's or husband's name is, um, ask about their kids, you know, all those kind of things just help build relationships and that helps you walk into rooms more confidently with less doubt. Um, oh, looks, I think we're, I think we're, unfortunately we're coming to the end. <laughs> yes. Um, 
sorry, we're just kind of being on this. Um, gosh, well, we want to thank everybody so much. We want to thank all of you for joining us. And um, I guess further to the, the mentorship that everybody's talking about, I just wanted to add that everybody here told you how to reach out to them. And all of the women executives that we know are always willing to take time to do an informational. So don't be afraid to reach out to someone and ask if they can take an hour and just share with you their story and give you some advice. I know we had some very targeted questions on here that we didn't have time to, to address, but um, people are really willing to try to help you out and, and try to help you sort things in your own mind and, and also kind of keep you on their radar so that you can continue to reach out and let them know how you're doing. So um, thanks again. I mean, we're looking forward to, to doing another one of these hopefully fairly soon. I don't want to take all the time away from Anita. <laughs> yes, no, thank you, everybody. Um, this was great. And um, definitely look forward to doing another um, panel uh, at the top of the year. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for your time. And um, thank you. For thank us. you. Thanks thank for you. tuning in. It's great thank to you. meet everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you.